Hello and welcome to this video in the series on system engineering and this time the subject is budgets. If you were hoping for advice on how to make that student loan stretch further well I'm afraid we're probably not going to be too much help. But budgeting money is where the concept of budgeting and engineering evolved. A budget was originally a leather pouch that could contain money. It was in effect another name for a purse. In the 18th century the government's statement on the national finances acquired the nickname budget because it was a look inside the nation's purse. And later it became a general term for a comparison of income and expenditure. In engineering, the term is not only used for money, but to any quantifiable and limited resource in the system that requires monitoring, like the mass, for instance, or the electric power. So what is a budget? In almost all systems, and certainly those produced by the aeronautical and astronautical industries, a consequence of requirements will be limitations of the resources that are available to the system. Budgets are the way that these limited resources can be allocated, monitored and controlled. The key features of a budget are that it details the individual components that produce and consume the resource, it balances the incomings and the outgoings, and it is normally an estimate for the future. So what should be budgeted? Well, the answer is any and indeed all quantifiable resources. Once budgeting is appreciated, an industry tends to embrace the technique and use it everywhere. So let's look at the typical system budgets on a spacecraft. The source of the constraint is identified in each case and you can see that they are derived from very early system design decisions on things like the launch system, the size of the power generation system, which is determined by the size of the solar rays, and the propellant tank size. These decisions are interactive. For example, the size of the tank and the size of the solar rays have an impact on the mass. So early spacecraft design is normally a high level iterative process exploring the design space to be looking for the balance of these critical parameters that are there so that we know we have adequate resources to ensure the successful completion of the system at the end of the day. Now, I would love to show you a real spacecraft budget, but these are rarely in the public domain as they give away far too much commercial or indeed military information. But here is one from a student project in Bristol in the early 1990s. This was intended for a piggyback launch on Ariane. It resulted in a few interesting undergraduate projects, but ultimately was too big for the limited objectives that it had. It, this could actually be accomplished in a CubeSat. We have three budgets here. The maximum mass was set by the launch system requirements. The power available is determined by the size of the panels and the sunlight they receive while the satellite is tumbling. We can see the principle of budgets here. All the components of the flight spacecraft are listed and how much of each resource they require is noted. By summing them, we can tell that we have enough of the resource to meet their demands and the difference between the required and the available resource is known as a margin. Margins and their analysis is a key objective of using budgets. If we are to be successful at the end of the day, the system will need to have positive margins in all its budgets. So we will be returning to this important subject later in the video. Mark, so you say that we never really got permission to use real commercial uh, spacecraft mm. budget to use as an example. Why are companies so sensitive about this? Well, the reason is that they are so giveaway of what's the thing. You can find almost everything about a spacecraft from a mass budget in particular. Um, for example, when we were bidding in Marsat 2, um, we were getting uh, thrusters from a company in Germany. The same company was producing the whole propulsion system for our competition. And some um, oh, a clown, you can only describe it as that, sent the proposal for the thrusters to our competition and the proposal for the competition's propulsion system to us. And there was enough information in that for us to get an awful lot of the mass budget of our competitor spacecraft, which meant we knew how 
wherever they were in a mass situation we knew they were in a bad mass situation we knew how they were splitting the spacecraft up we knew a lot about the technologies the key technologies they were using some of it we guessed already but i mean we learnt an awful lot about their spacecraft it didn't alter what we did but it meant that we could go into the bidding uh, phase the final bidding phase when we were negotiating with inmarsat with a bit more of a confident spring in our step because we knew we would the other side would blink before us uh, and there's another example from the inmarsat project we were going to have a payload from hughes aircraft in um, in Los Angeles, in South Los Angeles, in um, California, um, and they were making 90% of the world's communication satellites. But for political reasons, they felt they had to team with us. So they weren't going to use their um, 367 bus, which was the majority bus at the time. And so, as an act of faith, because we they would be seeing our spacecraft and our mass budget as an act of faith they showed us the mass budget for the 367. Um, but it was, a, it was a recognition of the value of the mass budgets that they did this. Um, and of course our guys analysed it. Um, and it, it, we, we got a lot, a lot of stick because I was effectively um, within the structures group, mechanical systems was within the structures. And we kept getting memos saying Q's aircraft are producing structures at 5% of the carry weight and yours are six percent why are yours so much heavier and you know so eventually we went back to them and said yes but compare the mechanical integration subsystem and then there's a sort of pause and they said but we don't have a mechanical integration mm -hmm. subsystem no because the things in the mechanical integration subsystem are in our structure mm -hmm. if you added the two together we were actually quite a bit lighter than hughes so again, you're finding out from that not just where they stand technology-wise, where they stand in, co in competition with you, but you're also finding out how they're organising their spacecraft and th therefore how their, the project organisation is working. We knew that they must be handling mechanical, in mechanical integration, the nuts, the bolts, the brackets and everything, separate from the group that handles the main, main structure. So... I mean, basically, if you show me a picture and a mass budget, I can decompose a spacecraft to an immense amount of detail and, and make a huge technical assessment. So uh, that's why they're important, and that's why people are sensitive about them. They, they are perhaps the most revealing single thing you can put out in the public domain. And of course, you'll know that when customers, are, we're proposing to customers, what's the first thing the customers want to see? In yes. your proposal, they want to see the mass budget. Yeah. So, budgets are important. In real projects, there are key elements in the way the system level team first define and then monitor and control the system design as it progresses. In the requirement generation phase, system feasibility designs are produced to check the requirements. These are not intended to be the best or final solution. They merely prove that a system meeting the requirements is possible. A key part of proving that feasibility is that the budgets are all re realistic. Whenever we see reports on concept proposals, the first thing to look at is the mass budget. Are we seeing realistic numbers and are the margins enough? For example, when Mark published his technical paper describing the Scorpion, he included this mass budget. It's probably a little light to make an assessment on feasibility if this were a serious project proposal, but enough to show a system like this is credible and typical of published budgets for early concept designs. As we've seen, in the early stages of system design, when the subsystem requirements are being established, the budgets enable the subsystems, like power, to be sized. This is where the balance of, say, the power system and the power it can provide is balanced against the impact it has on the mass budget. In the later life cycle phases, the continued maintenance of budgets can be a key tool to maintain insight into the status of a system during its development. Because it monitors interface parameters, it quickly highlights that problems exist and where they are, but not what they are. They act as a fire alarm network that connects the system level team into the lower levels. So they provide a reassurance as the design progresses that every element of the system will be getting the resources it needs to fulfil their function. 
and as long as the margins in every budget are positive, things are OK. But we've noted that budgets are a tool to understand the situation it is at present. But we can argue that it can also be used as a tool to determine if we're likely to get into trouble later in the development programme as the system design matures. They can be used to assess the risks for the future and to, that, to do that we need to consider margins in more detail. We have seen that margins are the differences between the estimated total of a budget and the total resource available to the system. The objective is to have a positive margin throughout with the system consuming less of the resource than it's providing. But in an optimised system you do not want that margin to be too large. If you're only using half the power the system can provide, then the power system is twice the size it needs to be, and so it's twice the mass and probably close to twice the cost. So we'd like to keep the margin small. The problem with this is just because you have a positive margin at the moment, that is no guarantee that you will still have a positive margin a year or two down the line as the design progresses. The trick is to have included sufficient margin in the system design phase to cover for all the uncertainties in the later design, build and development phases. But you must not also grossly oversize the allocations. No estimate of the actual situation in the future is going to be accurate. This is especially true at the start of the project, which of course is exactly the time when the information would be of most use. Commitment to specifications and design features is made at this time before the system has even been designed in detail, let alone built and tested. It is therefore important to be able to allocate margins that cover the uncertainty in the budget. However, these cannot generally be too great because this can affect the competitiveness of the system and in some cases even bring into question the feasibility of the system. In short, margins should accurately reflect the uncertainty in the early estimates. Well Bob, this may seem blindingly obvious but it was a lesson that was learnt the hard way in the early stages of the space industry. Yes, the, the, I, this, this is a chart about the growth of the Apollo Lunar Module. Um, it wasn't that they were stupid, they knew they had very firm views as to how you did this and, and so forth um, and they allowed a great big margin uh, because the lunar module was sitting right at the top of the stack and if that grew in weight mm. everything else grew and you didn't fly mm. um, so they gave something like a 27 percent mass margin on the original estimate um, and that as expected uh, grew slowly uh, during the the, the phase. Um, in fact there's a interaction going on here because in fact the mass growth on the hardware was only about 11% mm. but because the lunar module was propelled if you put more mass that you had to land on the moon mm. then the mass of the propulsion system increased and so forth and so halfway through it was apparent that they weren't going to uh, to make it. Mm. They had a major weight reduction program. Yeah, which and included throwing out the seats and the windows yes, yep. uh, and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And still, at the end of it, they made their 20% margin, but only just. I think actually they were slightly over, but the Saturn V was slightly better was than slightly you expected. Better than expected yes. So yes. Uh, they were saved from that. Uh, uh, but that, that just goes to show that uh, well-designed programs uh, yes. nevertheless need allowance for quite big uh, mass growth and of course in that case they were they were doing something new to in fact new to everybody yes. particularly I mean they were an aircraft company yes. they're not actually made the, any yes. space hardware yes before. The, the, the limit the experience was low and so when we talk about margins now yeah it's the result of 50 60 years of, of experience of dealing yeah. with these problems. I certainly remember a presentation by Boeing on an orbital transfer vehicle back in 81, I think, at a, yes. a British Interplanetary Society symposium, and being struck when they put their mass budget up and said, and we have a 20% margin. This may sound large, but on our experience, <laughs> this is the sort of margin yes. you must have on a, a system. And so now so. that's what everybody puts on a new project. Let us look at the problem. 
The mass history of the Apollo lunar module, while an extreme example, shows the general trend. So here is an idealised mass history over a project lifetime. But other budgets will follow a, a very similar pattern. In the requirement generation phase, we do not have a system design that is intended to be produced. Just feasibility designs, which are used to establish that the requirements are able to be met and what they are likely to cost. And therefore, perhaps not surprisingly, the mass estimates can vary a lot, but it will get the project into the right ballpark. And there will probably be some sort of system limit set at this stage. But as we noted in the requirements video, things like mass and power count as technical solutions and so should not be included in the system requirement specification. So why do we explore these things at this stage? Well, they're important because some parameters like mass and power are likely to be the basis for the estimated cost of the project. In the system design phase, the estimates will still go up and down, but as the system design team try to find the optimum system configuration. But experience shows Mostly they grow, as the detail that emerges requires extra stuff like mass. During this phase, the system design will be frozen, and with it the maximum parameter limits, that is the maximum mass, the maximum power, etc. To alter these values later in the development project is extremely difficult, as it effectively means unfreezing the system design, and doing this has considerable impacts on cost, schedule and risk. So having an adequate margin at this point is very important. And when we get to the detailed design phase, the various subsystem specifications have been issued and will include the resource allocation to that subsystem. It means the resource estimation and control is now in the hands of the subsystem teams who would typically be in separate companies. At the start of the detailed design phase, there is normally a little honeymoon effect as the optimism of the contractors who are doing the subsystem affects the early estimates. But then as the detailed design progresses, realism takes over. Until we reach the point at the end of the detailed design where the margins have evaporated and the panic starts to set in. I have called this the engineering model bulge as the engineering models that are made to qualify the design are usually the first real test of the paper estimates and they often come in a little heavier. Of course, at this point, you do not need as much margin as there is considerably less uncertainty in the design. But this is also the time when the testing starts to highlight unforeseen issues that normally take some resources to resolve. So this can be the darkest hour for a project as the money, time and resources all run out together. But assuming you can get through these detailed design issues into production, it is rare for there to be a subsequent problem. In fact, production units are normally a little better than engineering models, as less mistakes are made and the team have learned how to make it more efficiently. So at the end, hopefully, you are below the maximum allowable, but not by a lot, so the overall system is optimised and efficient as possible. But the key point is to set the resource limitation correctly when the system design is complete, which means we have to find a means to use budgets as a predictive tool to assess the risks ahead. What this shows is that resource growth over the estimates in the system design phase is an inevitable fact of life. In, in the aerospace world, this is particularly true of system mass, but it's pretty well true of all the resources. Some of it is a consequence of optimism, but it's also a consequence of the unintended emergent properties that are discovered as the detailed design progressives. So what do we do about margins? We do know of project managers who assume that if they have a positive margin in their budgets, everything is OK. But the history of growth in resource demand shows this is a dangerous practice. There are two key problems here. Firstly, it means that when a negative margin requires action to resolve the situation, it's already unacceptable and it probably occurs late in the development programme when resolving problems like this are expensive. And secondly, 
It's an inadequate way to establish what the system limit should be set at in the system design phase. In short, this is not using margins as a way to plan forwards. So we need to establish if the positive margin we currently have is large enough to cope with later growth because of things we've forgotten, mistakes in the estimating, the impact of design changes, build errors and the like. Which means we need rules to determine what is the minimum acceptable margin for the position we're in at any stage to be reasonably sure that we're not going to get into trouble later. At this point, we should perhaps look to the words of Donald Rumsfeld's famous 2002 quote, which in essence says there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. We can see the known unknowns as the things we're uncertain about, such as the precise loads on the structure. In theory, estimates of the uncertainty could be made, but in our experience this is very rarely done because of the dominating impact of the unknown unknowns. A consequence of the unexpected emergent properties and unexpected outside events. So why are we certain that the unknown unknowns dominate and how can we account for them? Well, we use the history of past developments. By looking at the history of resources growth over the project life cycle on past projects of similar type. From this we can assume that our new project is likely to have similar resources growth. Here we have typical recommended margins for mass on components based on the development status of that component. At the beginning, when we have only an initial estimate for the mass of a new component, it's recommended that we add 20% to the estimate to be safe. New designs inevitably involve more unknown unknowns. It's often difficult for engineers looking at their carefully worked out design to understand that the degree of uncertainty can be this big, but history repeatedly shows it is. Where there are modifications to existing design, it's no surprise that history tells us that margins can be reduced. The trap here is the margin is not to cover the changes on the existing design, but is applied to the estimate after the modifications are included. And at the bottom of the chart, even if the components have been made before and that you can take it and put it on the scales and weigh it and you're not altering it, we still apply a 1-2% to margin. But another important point here is that these margins apply to the elements of the system only. A common mistake is to think that having covered all the element mass uncertainties, then you've covered all the system uncertainties. This can be badly wrong. A system has internal interactions between subsystems and components, and surprises can emerge late in the development process. The system designer needs a reserve to deal with the problems that are not the consequence of components failing to meet their requirements, but the unknown unknowns that are a result of unforeseen and unintended interactions at system level, and the things that somehow got left out in the initial design. So there needs to be a further margin on top of these to cover this system level uncertainty. Students are often surprised to discover there are margins on top of margins and sometimes ask, aren't we flying more margins than hardware? The answer is that it can seem so at the beginning, but our experience teaches that these margins can rapidly disappear as we move towards flyable hardware. I think this need can be seen in a project that I was working on very early in my career at British Aerospace. It was called the European Communication Satellite and as it was being assembled a number of shortfalls in the electrical design were emerging. This actually required a new electronics box which was called the Interface Intercept Unit with the acronym IFIU. It was a deliberate joke because the real meaning was it stood for I forgot it unit. Now the mass, the power for this new unit was not covered by any component margin. It had to come from the system level. So Bob, that begs the question, what sort of overall system margin should we be looking at at the early stages of a project? Well, the quick answer to that is that with ESA projects, uh, they want at least 20% system level margin. Now everybody, Below that, all the subsystems, all the components have margins yeah. and those margins are kind of declared as assessments of the risk associated with that 
uh, and by reading mm. you could tell that. And to that extent, as the components evolve, as they get closer to being real hardware, mm. you would expect the uh, perhaps the, mar uh, the, the mass to grow, but the margin to decrease. So you keep within that boundary. Mm. And if you don't keep within that boundary, you're in serious trouble. Yeah. The 20% is in the system designer's back pocket. It's yeah. his, not yeah. everybody else's to use. It's his for all sorts of things. One is the I've got it bits. Yeah. Uh, another of them is yeah. to take account this, there are interactions between different systems. Mm -hmm. So if somebody kind of gets a bit larger than they ought to, yeah. it has impacts elsewhere. And so yeah. the system designer has a room for the maneuver uh, to keep the design within its total as a consequence of that. Right. Um, so this is 20% on top of all the components and subsystem margins. It's 20% dry mass margin yeah. as a whole, on yeah. top of everybody else. And people, uh, students particularly, uh, look at me when I announce this and say, hang on a minute, you've put 20% on the unknown mm. uh, pieces of hardware and so forth yeah. down below, and you put in another 20%, you're flying more margins than you are hardware. Yes. And the answer to that is, uh, not when you've finished. It no, will but, get absorbed. But it is a very safe philosophy, and ESA yes. programs do fly, uh, science programs do fly quite a bit underweight. Um, I mean, yes. for example, I know mm. on Mars Express, um, the original Beagle lander was to some extent taken out of the original system margin and at launch they could have doubled the weight of the Beagle lander. And they didn't tell us about and that and that was naughty. Yes, yes. Uh, um, but, um, and I do detect a slight difference here that um, if you have a commercial communication oh, satellite yes, we wouldn't have that, yeah. and, um, and it grows in weight mm. a little bit, then you probably pay more for the launch and you probably reduce the the, the uh, lifetime of the vehicle. I can't recall user. anyone ever upping a launcher because you tend to have designed for that fairing. No, well, launch. So it's normally a, an impact on lifetime. Yes. Uh, but it's a cost impact. It's a cost impact. Right. It's also in, that you're under different pressure. Yes. Because in when the case you're in the big a, phase... In the case of a science mission... Yeah, you're not in competition. Then you're not in competition, but if you... Go over, they're, they're normally fairly close to limits on launch vehicles and so forth. Yeah. And if you go overweight, you don't fly. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and of course, in a communication satellite, yeah. you fly, but you take a pet yeah. cost penalty. But also, if you turned up to in a, in a proposal, um, what the customers, and I can tell you this because I've negotiated with customers, what they want to see is value for money. Yes. They want to see they're buying a system as at the limit of that yes. launch vehicle yes. and they're getting stuff they're not. Uh, so you're under a different sort of pressure. And again, we must remember on aircraft, again, they probably don't have quite the... They're more relaxed attitude about yes. I mean, it's important, but it's not quite as crucial yes. as it is for spacecraft because right. it just affects your payload and your range a bit. It's, uh... So we have seen that the mass margin and the way that it is estimated is very important, but also that the large margins required at the system design phase can be problematic. And there's another problem at this stage. Mass estimates come from the specialist engineering departments for the bits of the system that they produce. Now, ideally, these should be pure estimates with an accompanying assessment of the probable error so a suitable margin can be allocated. But in practice, many engineers will have hidden a margin in their estimates to the system engineering team, knowing that they will be under pressure later. I've even seen this hiding of margins institutionalised, where the mass estimating department used funny density values for the materials like aluminium, so that they would automatically include a margin that would not be seen. This use of hidden margins is not good practice, as nobody ends up with a good overview of what the system status actually is. But if engineers are to be persuaded to give up hidden margins, they have to be given adequate open margins. And further, once these open margins are agreed, the system engineering team should treat them as frozen and beyond further question. So we have two problems at the system design phase. Firstly, is getting acceptance of a large system margin that will be required to minimize this project risk. And secondly, getting pure estimates from the engineers so the system team have a full understanding of the real margin in the estimates.
The way I have handled this in early system design studies is by considering where the project would end up when a full team is up and running in the detailed design phase. There will be tiers of contractors with tiers of corresponding specifications and every one of those contractors at every level will want the specified mass power etc to have a margin over what they estimate they need. So at the system level Although the key parameters might not be actually specified within the system requirements, indeed we've argued they shouldn't be, the system design that responds to those requirements will have resource limits. And as we have seen, that will require a system margin. This is the margin that ESA want to see at around 20%. The system design team will then have agreed subsystem requirement specification with the teams who undertake the subsystem design and development. Whether they be in-house or external contractors, the process is very similar. Now, the subsystem is a system in its own right, so it has the same uncertainties and problems at its level as the overall system design team have at theirs. So naturally, the subsystem will require its margins. The difference here is that the subsystem requirement specification will have the maximum values for those key parameters defined in it because it's their allocation from the system total. Out of this resource allowance that the requirements have set has to come a margin for the subsystem level issues but also the margins required at the next level that is the components of the subsystem. Every component will also be made to a requirement specification and like all the other levels it will require a margin. How much margin will depend upon the maturity of the design and the production history and we have already discussed what sort of levels are appropriate at this level. So this is where we end up and what I recommend doing is splitting out these various margins right at the start even in concept and feasibility designs. Well, that may seem obvious, but on communication satellite projects that I worked on in the 1980s, we simply took all the component estimates, summed them up and saw what margin we had and then made an overall judgment about where we stood on that basis. For example, on Imosat 2, during the bid phase when we were creating the system design, at one point we only had four kilograms of margin in a spacecraft of mostly new design and with a dry mass of around half a ton. Now that's a margin below 1%, which in any circumstances was unacceptable. With a lot of work, I got that margin back up to 20 kilograms, or about 4%, which is still inadequate, but, well, almost defendable. Then, at the project progress meeting, when I announced with, with some pride that I'd got us into this position, one senior manager, the, the chief system engineer, in fact, said, hmm, 20 kilograms. What can we use that for? So after that experience, I always did a full margin breakdown from the start. The first reason is that it means that you will have done an analysis that gives you a rational basis for the assessment as to whether you have enough margin or not. It's not just making a judgment on the total margin. It also means that you have an argument to sell that margin to those outside the project, like the 20 kilograms, what can we do with that manager? When they see 20% on its own, naked and exposed, they think, hmm, that's a little large. Whereas if they're all 5%, 8%, it starts to look a little tight. The fact that when combined, they make 20% overall can be downplayed if politic to do so. After all, with the three levels we've identified, system, subsystem and component, it requires only 6.3% at each level to make 20% overall. That covers the first of the two problems we identified. But we can also address the second problem, as we have a process that gives the specialist engineers in the project involvement into the margin assessment and a buy-in to the outcome. And finally, it means that there is a longer, more considered process to establishing the final system level allocation of margins that everyone on the project can see and contribute to as the design evolves. It is when the specialist engineers can see that they have a degree of control over the margins in their area that they're willing to unhide their assessment of the uncertainties in their estimate. 
I used this methodology in a study I did a couple of years after in MOSAT called the BAE Multi-Role Capsule. This study was a little unusual in that a full mass budget was published in a technical paper and this was done largely for political reasons. The study was trying to highlight a much easier route for Europe to get an independent means to launch its astronauts than the French-led Hermes project. The Hermes had required a new launch system, Ariane 5, and even though it had what was effectively a bespoke launcher, we knew that it was in serious mass problems. So to emphasise the advantages of the capsule approach, we showed a full broken down mass budget against the carrying capacity of Ariane 4, just to rub it home. So the mass budget showed that overall there was a 22% margin, which was the sort of numbers judged adequate at the time, although a little light by comparison with the sort of numbers that we've been suggesting in this video. As you can see, both the subsystem estimated mass and the proposed subsystem specified mass are shown and that still left the system level with a 14% margin. Although Bob was saying that ESA science missions would be looking for 20%, I feel comfortable with anything over 10% for a project like this. Where in hindsight we were a little optimistic is the margins at the component level. Again, we published the split between the margins at the subsystem level and the margins allocated to the components. At this component level, you will see margins of 5% on what are essentially new designs, which is rather risky. As we have seen earlier, we should be looking at 10, maybe even as high as 20% for components uh, with this sort of level of definition. But overall, this detail was a big improvement over the way earlier studies handled such matters, and it made its point. And had we been put to the test, I'm confident we would have succeeded in producing a seven ton capsule that met the specification. So that gives you a feel for mass budgets and how the margins are constructed. Other budgets that we think about in system engineering tend to work the same way, by adding up a total. Even the communications link budget, thanks to communication engineers choosing to use a logarithmic scale to convert a long multiplication formula into an addition sum. However, the way in which we deal with margins in different cases are not all the same. And this is a matter of understanding what we're trying to do with margins. In the case of a mass budget, the margins are there to ensure that the total mass is not exceeded even as a component and overall system design becomes more mature. And we discover that the initial approximation es estimates were optimistic. This is why the mass budget is so important in space systems. If the mass is too large, we may not fly at all. In the case of power budgets, there are likely to be multiple power budgets representing the different operational cases the system may encounter. Here is a simplified power budget calculation for a robotic moon lander that I worked on. As you can see, there are multiple cases to consider depending on what the spacecraft is doing and whether it is illuminated by sunlight at the time or not. Here, the margin is to ensure that the power supply, the array, will always be sufficient to cope with the system's demands. In this case, we need to find the worst case power demand and then put a supply or array, array margin above that, here marked and set at 20%. In the case of a terrestrial system plugged into a power point in the wall, we would set the associated circuit breakers a little above, but not too far above, the worst case value. However, in the case of satellite power, it's not only the array size that we have to determine, but we also use batteries to supply power to the system when the arrays are in shadow. In this case, we hide the margin by defining a maximum depth of discharge the batteries are allowed in the worst case scenario, marked in column 4. And the size of the arrays will include an allowance to allow the batteries to be recharged when the arrays are illuminated again which is why column 3 represents the minimum array margin. In the case of a communications link, we have the so-called transmission equation relating received signal to output transmitter power. Rather than multiplying all the terms together, 
Communication engineers use a logarithmic scale to construct a linked budget that can be added together to find the received power. This equation looks something like this. A footnote in one reference suggests this rather curious transformation is not because communication engineers cannot multiply, but perhaps more to ensure their continued employment as communication engineers. However, in this linked budget, the various terms in the equation are not all the same sort of thing. Some are antenna gains, some sources of noise, some simple RF power outputs. Here, the vital margin is the signal to noise ratio within the receiver at the end of the chain. And here we set a margin based on experience. As with power, we can expect to do multiple link budget cases to find the worst set of circumstances where we need to maintain communications. But there are circumstances when simply adding up margins is not realistic. When some property of a system is subject to multiple random errors, then we need a different approach. In the case of the lunar lander I mentioned earlier, the task was to bring it down from lunar orbit to land at a precise location on the Moon's surface. The problem was that for much of the descent, the spacecraft would be using its inertial measurement system to perform dead reckoning navigation, and only at the end of the burn would it see the, the surface and its intended target. Our concern was to determine just how far adrift it might be at this point, and how far it would need to manoeuvre to achieve a pinpoint landing. The table shows our estimates of uncertainties in the position and velocity of the spacecraft due to the various factors affecting the navigation. They go from an initial uncertainty of the position of the spacecraft at the start of the descent, through uncertainties about the Moon's gravitational field and finally the performance of the navigation and control system itself. If we assume that each of the errors forms a normal Gaussian distribution, then we can add them up using a root sum squared total, that is taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual values, and that's what's been shown here. If the errors do not form a Gaussian distribution, then we might have to use more sophisticated or brute force approaches like Monte Carlo analysis, but let's ignore that for now. What this analysis shows is that close to the end of our descent, we could have an error of about 900 metres in position and a velocity error of about 11 metres a second. But that's not the end of the story. What this actually says is there is a 68% probability the spacecraft will be within 900 metres of its required position, but a 32% probability that it will be further away. We call this the standard deviation or sigma, and if we wanted to be more certain, we'd have to draw a bigger circle. With a two sigma margin, we would have a 95% probability that the spacecraft will be there, and at three sigma, a 99.7% probability. The spacecraft, therefore, needs to be able to correct its position in those final moments of descent by 1800 metres at two sigma value, or 2700 metres at three sigma value. Adding up error budgets in this way is unusual and only applies where the errors are random and statistical. And the root sum square answer is only a measure of the statistical variation. To apply an adequate margin, we would have to multiply this by two or three, depending on how secure you want to be, to get an adequate margin. For the majority of cases, we would construct budgets by summing the best estimates of the component values, and then by adding adequate margins, in most cases based on experience, to get the worst case values. Budgets are a key component of the way system designs are managed, much more significant than you might have initially imagined. The amount of resources an element of a system consumes is often one of the most critical and uncontrollable of its interfaces. You'll see this importance when we look at system models in the next video.